welcome to the Lord's house this morning. It's good to see you all in. <coughs> a special welcome, well, a special welcome to you all, uh, but also a special welcome to the Arthur family who are joining us who are in Calgary for a week. And they used to attend here, and so they are there on the one, two, three, fourth row on that side. So do, um, if you, many do know them, and I've already made their uh, welcome uh, known, but if you don't know them, then do go and greet them at the end of the service. I have some other announcements to make. Uh, this coming Friday is the last Young Adults Fellowship of the season, so it'll be slightly different than usual. Not too sure exactly what we're going to do. We've got some ideas, but do come along, bring food as well. And that was part of the idea as well, that we'd have something more substantial to eat. A prayer meeting this uh, coming uh, Tuesday uh, at 7 p.m., and I would lead that meeting, but our brother Lewis Marshall is bringing a message uh, before we get down to prayer. There's a gospel outreach in Picture Butte this coming Wednesday at 7.30. Do remember that in your prayers, please. Um, to celebrate the end of our season, the end of the adult Bible class and the Sabbath school for children and all the fellowship meetings that we have, the Friday fellowship meetings, we're having an end of season potluck lunch uh, on June 26, so that is next Lord's Day, immediately after the morning service. There's a list on the back table um, to put down that, uh, which food you would be bringing with you. And just reminded again that uh, regarding church cleaning, do please add your name to the list. Uh, this evening we have our uh, evening service at 6 p.m., preceded by a half hour time of prayer. Let me encourage the people of God to come to that time of prayer also. I've already mentioned Tuesday's Bible study at 7 p.m. and the Young Adults Fellowship on Friday at 7. Uh, next Lord's Day uh, is, as I mentioned, is the last adult Bible class of the season at 10 a.m. And then we have morning worship at 11 and evening worship at 6. And I am the, the preacher in the Lord's will at those four said meetings. I have no further updates about Chance and Schmidt. No news we trust is good news. Um, and Dave Boland, the man I've been visiting in hospital, is, uh, has given a profession of, of making, having made peace with God and have uh, found um, or refound, however that was, his relationship with the Lord. He certainly seemed a lot more revived uh, spiritually when I last spoke to him. And so do remember him in your prayers still. And remember Brooks. Uh, Nesbitt, that needs our prayers at the moment. Also, for details, ask him uh, regarding him. All these announcements are subject to the sovereign will of Almighty God. Please take up your hymn books. At the very back, we've got a collection of Psalms, Psalm 89a. Psalm 89a, a great praise psalm. God's mercies I will ever sing, and with my mouth I shall thy faithfulness make to be known to generations all. We'll stand to sing these seven verses and the last verse a cappella, please.
Let us draw nigh to God in prayer together, please. Let us pray. Our merciful and loving God and Father, in the name of thy Son, we approach thy holiness this morning and give thee thanks for thy love toward us. We thank thee, Lord, that thou art our heavenly Father and thou art the one that we are to love with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, that we are to honor thee and reverence thee, fear thee, and obey thee as we've been considering in the fifth commandment this morning. And Lord, thou art a God to be worshipped and to be obeyed and glorified. And we thank thee for thy rich love towards us in Jesus, that that great love that we have that is commended to us in his death upon the cross before we were even born. And how good thou art to us. Thou art the, the source of all that is good, all good and perfect gifts come from thee, Father. And we thank thee that we are gathered in uh, to thy house today in the name of thy Son, in the presence of his Spirit. And Lord, what can we say that we are not worthy? We are not worthy. Thou art worthy, but we are not worthy. And yet thou art so gracious and merciful and long-suffering towards us, even though we are not the same to each other, and yet thou art towards us. We thank thee that thy love is an unconditional love, for we would lose it within a millisecond if it was conditional. But we thank thee for thy precious grace. O oh Lord, the grace and the love of God. And Lord, wilt thou forgive us our many sins? For we have sinned against thee and against each other We've sinned against our consciences. We've sinned against knowledge of the Scriptures. Lord, forgive us. Cleanse us afresh, and as thou wilt cleanse us, O God, and we know that thou shalt do so, because the blood availeth much. Will thou be pleased, O Lord, to grant us grace to conquer those fleshly and sinful desires and actions and words and thoughts that are within? that keep on coming up day in and day out, over which we have not had the victory. And we cannot, Lord, except thou grant us grace from heaven. Will thou do so? Will thou soften our hearts? Will thou humble us? Remember those amongst us, Lord, who are, have, do not have the forgiveness through Christ. We pray for thee to be merciful to them. However young or old they are, will thou be merciful? Will thou draw them with those cords of love that they would make peace with God? Lord, whether they're five years old or 95, come with that irresistible grace that saves the worst of sinners and changes them into saints before God. Bless all those who are joining us online also or are unable to be with us this morning for whatever reason. Lord, may they know thy rich blessing and help and that thy word will be opened unto us to be food for the soul, to challenge us, to provoke our fleshly nature. Lord, that we would repent once more, that we may know the reviving work of the Holy Ghost within us. Remember those that need thy touch and need thy help. Are unable to be with us because of illness or old age. Remember our brother Merle, Lord, in his predicament. Lord, but thou grant respite. May it may please thee to grant him grace. Comfort him, Lord, in his pain. Remember also... Our brother Charles, we thank thee, Lord, that that second operation has been very successful. He's able to come out and be in our midst. We thank thee for that. Remember Chanson, Lord. I've heard nothing new about him for a few weeks now. We pray, Lord, that that young boy will be able to stand up from his bed. And, Lord, that he will be able to communicate with his 
family, that he may be able to glorify thy name. So comfort him also. We thank thee, Lord, that the Arthur family are in our midst. Lord, we thank thee for bringing them safely all the way from the U.S. And we do pray those, those matters that need to be dealt with in these coming days, that may, they may know the blessing of God uh, upon them. Lord, that will help and open doors in all matters, that it may be quickly and swiftly resolved. And if it be thy will otherwise, grant grace, Lord, to, to wait upon the Lord. So, Lord, we do pray also for our brethren and sisters throughout the world who are suffering for the gospel's sake. And there are many. We do pray, Lord, that thou wilt grant them all that they need, most especially that comfort and that strength to their soul from thine own presence, but also for their body. Lord, drink and food and shelter and clothing. O oh Lord, draw nigh unto them, we pray. And we pray, O oh Lord, for thy church worldwide that it may know great reviving and awakening, and great reformation from the pagan ways that have infiltrated it, whether it be the pagan rituals of Rome or the pagan beliefs of the charismatic movement. Lord, will thou have mercy? We pray for this country and all that rule her, that thou will grant wisdom and thy fear, restrain them from evil, which is their tendency by nature. Lord, we pray that thou will put the righteous and the godly in power. And Lord, will thou have mercy upon us. Help us now as we worship thee. Grant us all that we need. We pray thee, our Father, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's now time for your offerings to the Lord's word, work to be taken. I'm going to ask uh, our, our brother Deacon Caleb Struck to come and give a short word of prayer before the collection is taken. Uh, once the collection has been taken, and we'll remain seated while the collection is taken. We'll then stand to sing hymn 221, The Church is One Foundation. Thank you, brother.
We have two Bible readings this morning. The first is taken from Romans chapter 1. So would you turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 1. And that is the larger reading before we go to, back to the book of Genesis. To understand something of Romans 1 gives us something of the, the spiritual and the moral and the theological background to what we'll read concerning the Tower of Babel. So Romans chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 1, and reading from verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth, that is, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense, that payment of their error, which was meet, was fitting. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unable to be brought to a peaceful conclusion, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So let's move there from that hefty passage all the way to Genesis 11, please. Genesis chapter 11. That is today that we will consider this, this morning and this evening uh, two different aspects or two different parts of this uh, narrative, this historical narrative in, in chapter 11. And so Romans 1 is involved, uh, Psalm 2, which we will sing at the end and we will read this evening, uh, and then Genesis chapter 11 all together in total. Chapter 11 of Genesis, and we'll read the first nine verses Chapter 11, reading from verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, 
and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Amen. Let us call upon the Lord briefly. Let us pray short prayer that we may know the Lord's help as we listen to the preaching. And as I preach, let us pray. Lord, we do thank Thee that we've had the privilege of hearing the Word of God in our ears, in our own language, that we've understood what Thou hast written, and maybe not every word and every phrase, but Lord, enough. And we thank Thee, Lord, uh, for uh, the Scriptures and this faithful translation. Lord, we thank Thee that we have the whole counsel of God before us, and just this small portion today to understand what Thou wilt say to us. And so, Lord, we do pray that thy speaking voice will speak not only into our ears, but also into our hearts, that we may understand more of thee and thy ways, that we may know uh, what it is, how we are to apply and to understand thy word. So give unto us, Lord, that, that help from heaven. Give unto me uh, that unction that I need to preach thy word. Lord, give help. Lord, that the word may go forth fluently. Give strength and utterance and wisdom. O oh Lord, that Christ would be honored and glorified as his word is opened to feed his people. Lord, hear us, we pray, for Jesus' sake, for his glory. Amen. The persecution and the oppression of God's people is nothing new uh, by any means. We saw the first move against God's people in Genesis chapter 4. We saw Cain killing Abel, the godless Cain killing godly Abel. And so whether it's the, the, the oppression of, of God's Old Testament people, that would be the Old Testament Jew with the, with, with the, with the few pagan converts, or the New Testament uh, church with converted Jews and converted pagans. Uh, there is one church and there is one people, and we sang it now, just now in, in that hymn, uh, and that takes its quote from Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. And so, there's much more that could be said, and there's more that I prepared, but essentially it's this. The, the Bible always speaks of, a, of a, a biblical unity in the church, a biblical unity. If you were to read Romans 4, you would see that the grace and the gospel that, that Abraham understood saved him, saved by faith, and he was Righteousness was accounted to him because of faith. It's, it's the same gospel. Did he have all the details we do? Of course not. But he believed the promises of God. And so there is a union that therefore even in the New Testament church that Paul could, um, that Paul could write that, that, that Abraham is the father of all the faithful. He is our spiritual father in that sense that he is saved by faith and that his faith uh, causes him to be called righteous in God's sight. And so there is that, that unity, and what I'm trying to say is there is a unity of God's people throughout history, both Old and New Testament. The Old Testament church in the wilderness is called the church in the wilderness. Let's not play games with words and phrases. It is one church, there is one Savior. So having said that there is a united ch church, there is one church separated over the millennia, separated by language and culture, but spiritually one church that has also been a united focus against that church. 
There is a, a, a union against God and against God's people. And again, that may not be experienced by everybody who is against the church of God. Stephen uh, Hawking's may not know that he has a spiritual and a moral relationship through the devil with Nimrod. He may not be aware of that, but it still does not take away that truth that he has that uh, devilish relationship with him. I think his name is Stephen Hawkins. Or Dawkins. Dawkins, that's the man, the evolutionary biologist. But in any case, this, this unity that does exist and has existed at various times, and we've seen the forces of evil rise up against the people of God at various times, ultimately this, this unity of people against God's people is a unity of people against God. And we see it, as I mentioned, the very beginning, but that was just one person. But we go to the end, very, to the very end of the Bible, and we see the forces of Gog and Magog rising up against the people of God. It, 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 and that will be the last one. That will be the finish, a rising up. And we see something of this in, in, in this narrative that we have about the Tower of Babel. The building of the city of Babel and its tower shows us something of this. And in examining this, uh, this portion of Genesis 11, we've already read Romans 1, and we will refer to Psalm 2 both this morning and, and, and this evening, all being well. Because those three passages are, are, are linked. But let us look this morning with the Lord's gracious help at the pride of Babel. The pride of Babel. And firstly, we see... Uh, a pride-filled dominion. There's a pride-filled dominion as we consider what we have before us. And just make, make a, 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 a note on the first verse. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And you may think that, that that's a repeated phrase. It isn't. It's the language, is the language they speak. And speech means the words that they used. You can be in, you can have one language but have two different speeches. And I, I've come to know that as I moved across from the UK to Canada. We, we can be, we, you know, one language separated <laughs> by a, a stretch of water. And, and that means phrases and vocabulary can be different. And what it's saying is there was no difference of vocabulary. Everybody said, if, if, we, if we said the rubbish bin, we didn't mean the trash can. Everyone knew what it was. There was no variance there was no change. There was one language, one vocabulary. The communication uh, was not disturbed or corrupted or challenged in any way. And that was the state of mankind from Adam. And we will touch upon that uh, this evening. But that, just to make that clear what that means. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, and we'll look at those details in a minute, that they found a place in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to... Come on, let us make brick and burn them throughly. That means through and through, thoroughly baked in a kiln. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. A pride-filled dominion then is our first point and what is this pride filled? Well, it's a sinful dominion, a sinful desire to rule over others. To rule over, and this is what we see throughout history, we see it in interpersonal relationships as well, but we're looking at a far bigger scale this morning, is the desire to dominate and control somebody else made in the image of God. And is that, is that, is that, a, is that a, a God-given right to rule? No, we're talking about dominion. We're talking about uh, showing uh, power to control, manipulate, use, whatever. And that sort of sinful dominion idea is behind totalitarianism of all sorts. This does not speak against uh, God-given authority. Although we know that God-given authority can be abused by those in power. And what is it, this fallen condition then, that wants to control others rather than control itself? That's the sinful aspect of temperance. I want to control you but I'm not going to control me. I'm not going to put myself under self-control. I'm not going to stel put myself under the Scriptures. No, but I'm going to decide what I think you should wear and shouldn't wear or what you should say and how you should behave, and I'm going to control you in some way. Intimidate, manipulate, whatever it might be. And that's, that's sinful. You see the sinful side. 
So God demands that we be self-controlled, that we be temperate, that we be careful, that we be meek. But the totalitarian, the, 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 the wickedness, the, the wicked extreme of that is to want to control and manipulate others. Exactly the same principle as Christ taught us. He says, you know, that you ought to be more concerned with the beam in your own eye than the mote in someone else's. It's exactly the same aspect, same principle, I should say. So ungodly control, ungodly dominion has been the desire of mankind in general since the fall. That's what we can see. We can see very quickly as, as mankind filled the earth, what did they fill it with? Violence. They filled it with violence. And even after the fall now, as, we're, as the generations are sort of building up and the earth is, well, no, earth is not quite being, fulf- being filled, but th- there are plenty of children being born, we see the same thing again. It's most especially with certain people. You can't tar everyone with the same brush. Not everybody is a Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was a Joseph Stalin. And there are people like Joseph Stalin around the world in politics and in big business and wherever they may be. So it does speak of certain powerful men and, and, and women, mostly men, and a lust for power, wealth, control, adulation, whatever. We have medical terms for that this day, these days, sociopath, narcissism, this idea to, to control others and get glory to yourself. And that's what we see throughout the nations. We see that in the case of Nimrod, and we'll look at him a little bit more closely, but others as well. We could think of Nebuchadnezzar. We could think of Cyrus the Great. We could think of others that are represented in the Scriptures, Herod and his family. A bunch of sociopaths. And a sociopath is somebody who has very little consideration about your feeling, all about themselves, what it does for them, what they can get from you. And the more extreme case would be the narcissist. Completely compassionless towards the other and obsessed with themselves. Unable, actually, to the extreme, unable to have any compassion, which is why they can commit so many dreadful crimes at the more extreme level. And so we see that played out on the world stage, in history, and today. Even the dictators we have around us today, the many dictators in in African countries, the dictators in in North Korea, uh, the Middle East, the various forms of communism and Islam, uh, are dictatorial uh, systems, that is, there's a one man or one group of people, and they dictate uh, to very fine levels what you can and cannot do. They are not the servants of the people. They expect the people to serve them. It is a demonic desire to unite all people against God. And that's what we see in the Tower of Babel. That's what we see even today, even in organizations that exist around the world without wanting to bring too much in, but there are great forces at work even today to bring around this one world government. And we know there's been plans that have been published. You can download them from official websites and read these plans and these initiatives that exist and they intend to move step by step to one world government. And, and with that one world government is to have one world religion. And of course we know that the Antichrist in Rome would like to be the head of that. The one world religion, well, what does that demand though? What, what is needed to get one world government with a one world religion, both of which are anti-Christian? Well, there needs to be a one world immorality, a one world morality that is contrary to God's true morality. Even if you don't research this stuff, even if you think everything that I've mentioned, which you can see, you don't have to go to bizarre websites, you can just read it on, uh, go to the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, you can go to these large organizations and many others, uh, all seeming working together, and just download their documents and read what they are planning. But even if you don't accept it, and you don't believe it, or you're not interested in it, you do see their influence. You do see their tentacles spreading throughout society. The people have not risen up in any country. I mean, the people en masse, I'm not talking about small groups, have not stood up and demanded, we want to change to society, we want to change to definitions, we want to change to all this. It has happened behind the people's backs. It's the tentacles have reached into the media, into the press, uh, which is the same thing, the media, into the education system, into academia, into all sorts of places 
you know, where there is a, a, a pride symbol, a pride rainbow put everywhere. It is, the, it is Pride Month. It's the month of pride. Uh, very fortuitous that we're reading about pride, man's pride. And that's what we see. Education, the media, academia, politics, in the armed forces. Unbelievably, in the armed forces. Police forces, big business are all promoting this, and it does not come from the people. There is, I would say, especially in the working class, although they're far from sinless, I don't mean to say so, a conservatism. A conservatism, and that's why the left wing and the Marxists have dropped the working class like a hot potato, because they're no longer manipulable, and now they've gone to other groups in society to use them for their ends. But let this not be an essay or lecture in, in Marxism. But everything that we see all comes down to the second half of Romans 1, which we did read. What we see in Romans 1, what do we see? We see a rejection of revealed religion, of the truth. They know it, but they're rejecting it. And what does that lead to? A rejection of natural morality. As so one thing leads to the other, and both of which then demand a rejection of the truth. Those three things we see very strongly in society today, and those things... Uh, were being dealt with. It's not explicit, but it is implicit in the Tower of Babel and what is happening there. So what Romans 1 teaches us, it gives us that theological basis for Babel. It gives us also the theological basis for Sodom and Gomorrah, excuse me, for all the cities of the plain, and it gives us the, that theological, spiritual, moral basis for what's happening in North America and in much of Europe today. Again, that's, uh, there is a, a simple, hard-working, working class, whether they're in Europe or they're in Africa, there's more of them in Africa, are more conservative and don't accept these things. Well, let's not go into those too many details at the moment. But in the context of our text, it is without doubt the setting that is behind what is happening in the land of Shinar. And this truth takes us back to the first man, this first man of dominion since the flood, the man called Nimrod, a man who was able to unite the people behind him and to build a godless empire through violence. His, his, uh, his nation, his, his empire was a godless empire. But we won't go into those details. We've already looked at some of the historical uh, references to who this Nimrod is in a previous sermon. But understand this, and I've mentioned it last time, so this will be catch up for those who weren't here last time. His empire and his ways were so godless and they were so violent that the people uh, that of Asher, uh, the people of Asher, uh, were driven out of the land of Shinar. It, it, we get that from chapter 10. Gen Genesis chapter 10 and verses 8 to 11 says, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher. So Asher, the, the, the son of Shem, the Semite, was already in the land of Shinar, and he had to leave, because here we had Nimrod establishing, conquering this, this area, this land of Shinar. It says, and he builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kala. And so we have that from Romans 1, the theologically corrupt background to Nimrod's empire. A man clearly in the grip of idolatry, and therefore, as Romans 1 teaches us, idolatry leads to immorality. Look at any idolatry, and you will see beneath the surface uh, revolting immorality. Look at the Church of Rome that has been absorbed with paganism, Christian paganism, or Christianized paganism. Yet it's, it's, it's no more Christian than a so-called Christian bookstore putting a fish sticker on a book and saying this is a Christian book when it should be burnt. Whatever book it might be, many books are not worthy to be called Christian. Now, just because the Church of Rome calls itself Christian, well, we can see there is a deep corruption and immorality and has been from the very early days and from their high point in the, in the, in the, in the 12th century in the 11th and 12th century there, but even to this day it is a, we won't mention, go into any details, but we know enough, those that know, the deep immorality is there. It's because they may use the name of Jesus, they may, they may use a Bible, and yet they do not truly preach or believe the gospel. 
So Nimrod himself, similar, in the grip of idolatry and immorality, which means what? That he's in the grip of Satan. He's under the control of the devil himself. And the devil always works through man's pride and lust for power. And that's why they are the two of most fleshly matters that need to be dealt with by conversion. We're to repent of uh, these, of pride. We're to, we're to repent of a lust for control of others. We're to be meek, to be humble. So pride-filled dominion is the very backdrop to what we see. But secondly, there's one world rebellion. And that brings us into the details uh, of what we see. But we have to make a little side trip to Psalm 2 first. So the, the start of Psalm 2 shows us this same rebellion at work, that it's not just man coming together and making himself a, a neutral empire. This, although, you know, the idea that something secular, something of the world, something that doesn't have um, the biblical Christianity, the heart of it, is somehow neutral is a lie. Secularity, secularism is not neutral. It is against God. It is against his anointed. There's nothing neutral about it. It's not schools. We say, oh, we get rid of the Bible and we'll just have nothing. That's not true. What is their morality? What is their worldview based on? Well, as we found out in the last 50 years, it's based upon the lies of Marx, mostly. Or other, or other religions. Marxism is a religion, of course. It's an anti-Christian religion. But one world rebellion is what we see secondly then. Psalm 2, verses 1 to 2. Why do the heathen rage? And we preached on this psalm already two years ago. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain and empty thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... We're not going to read what they say. What the point is, is that the heathen people and their rulers are raging against God. And we see that in the context here. They're raging against God because firstly we see in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 11 that they stopped migrating. They stopped migrating. Genesis 1 and, uh, 11 verses 1 and 2 it says, And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. They dwelt there. So they'd already begun to spread out. And we know that. From, from some of the details that we already have. It says, but interestingly, they journeyed from the east. How could they journey from the east if, they, if they've all come forth out of Ararat? From that northern air, mountain range, they've all come down. But how can they travel then from the east if they're coming down from the north? Well, who are they to begin with? They journeyed from the east. Well, especially, I would say, the sons of Ham the sons of, of, of Ham, and we see that uh, from verse 6. The sons of Ham, specifically Cush. Uh, specifically the sons of Cush, um, who were in league with Nimrod. It's the hand of Nimrod at work here. The son of Cush, uh, the son of Noah. It doesn't rule out that any other, any other offspring from Noah were not involved in this. We know that, one, uh, we know that the, uh, the Assyrians, the early Assyrians, the sons of Asher which are the same people, that they had already settled in the land of Shinar. So they had already settled there, but it says that they journeyed from the east. So if we're, if we're, if we're going to draw this imaginary map again. And so we have, say, that this is the Middle East. We have Israel here, which doesn't exist yet, but let's just say we've got all of this here. We have, the, we have uh, Egypt over here with the Red Sea and the two fingers. We have the Mediterranean Sea here. And we have the Ararat range up here. This is where the Ark uh, landed somewhere in the mountain range here. And what we have is the land of Shinar. The land of Shinar is the southern part of modern-day Iraq. It's really where the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers come together, and it's a, it ha was, and it still is, a very fertile area. Of course, it has rivers running through it, and many little rivulets and wadis around there as well. And so that this southern part here, uh, just at the very top of the Persian Gulf, I hope that helps you with your, with your, with your understanding of, of, the, of the Middle East and the near Middle East. So this is the land of Shinar here. To the right of it would be eventually Persia, and to the north of it would be, well, up here, the Media. And, and this is Jordan on this side, Arabia's yeah. down here. So it's this area here. And so that land had already been, had been settled by Asher, and yet they had all come down. Everyone had come down, and, and, and Mitzrayim had gone down here into Egypt, and they'd gone into various, so Asher was already here. 
Asher was already there, and yet it says that, uh, that, um, that Nimrod and the people that were allied with him came from the east. That's surely a contradiction. Of course not. There are no contradictions in the scriptures. Contradictions lie here. So we need to be, be conformed to the scriptures and understand, well, they've obviously come from the east, so they've already passed through. So in their migration, they've already gone past or through the land. And I would suggest to you that they ha have seen how fertile the land of Shinar is, uh, what we might call southern Mesopotamia these days, southern Iraq. A and they've seen how fertile it is. And it was green, it was flat, it was easy, easy land. It's just like the, the farmer doesn't choose to go necessarily in, in, you know, to, to farm in the foothills of the Rockies if he can have a nice, nice uh, well-watered plain. And so this is what we have, is a well-watered plain, green, fertile, and they pass through it, or they pass above it, or they know about it, but in any case, and what do they do when they go through the land of Shinar onto the other side? Well, they enter the foothills and the mountains of what we later call Persia. A difficult ground, a, a difficult land to, to farm. It, it is, is not easy. Not easy. But we know that it is Nimrod that eventually comes to rule uh, Babel. We understand that from Genesis Chen, so 10. So what could be understandable was that they've gone there towards Persia, seen the mountains, seen the difficult ground, and they've come from the east to conquer. And they've conquered. They've driven out Asher. They've driven out his people and those that were with him. And of course, conquest is never, or should say, rarely achieved except through violence and bloodshed. And that's why we understand that Nimrod has these two titles, a mighty one and a mighty hunter. But the Lord had already commanded Noah and his three sons to disperse themselves in, uh, with those words in Genesis 9 and verse 1. It said, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish, that means fill the earth. Fill the earth with what? With children and grandchildren, with people. And that's what they were to do. They were to go out, they were to be fruitful. There's nothing here about conquering each other. There's not, nothing about having dominion over each other. But they are to go out, they are to multiply, to fill the earth, and to fill the earth they must go out throughout the earth. And so they were to take their growing families into all the parts of the earth, to make some undwelt land their own. But we see that's not what he did. That's not what Nimrod did. And the whole earth was in one of speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. As I said, we know that Asher was driven out. So that is what we see as a portion of mankind, however much a portion that was. I don't believe it was all of them, but it was a, a portion of them that stopped spreading. They stopped spreading and settling in virgin land, as it were, but they conquered someone else's land, belonging to Asher. And as we know that Asher himself then fled, and they went up to the north. Um, they went up north, northeast, and settled there and later became a great empire. Probably picked up some bad tricks and bad ideas from Nimrod. But we see that uh, Nimrod and those in, in league with him, they stopped migrating and conquered and settled and built a great empire, as we see, with these great cities, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the north, in the, sorry, in the land of Shinar. So they stopped migrating, but why did they stop migrating? Well, the reason is given to exalt their own name. That's why they did what they did. Uh, verses 3 and 4 of Genesis 11 say this. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. That means through and through. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So here we have then Nimrod and all the, those that were in league with him uh, making plans, uh, making godless plans. They said one to another. That indicates once again that they could communicate freely. They spoke one another. They could make these plans. Go to. Let's, let's fulfill the plans that we have. There was no confusion of languages. There was one language, one dialect of that one language, one vocabulary of that long language. So there's no delay 
when you try to find a translator. There's no delay in trying to understand not only the language, but the culture behind that language, because again, if there's one language, there's one speech, there's one culture, there can be no misunderstanding. There can be no confusion. Even today, where people speak the same language in the same, in the same uh, country, can still trip over because you don't know their slang, you don't know their dialect or the way they pronounce a word. But that wasn't the case here. There was a direct and a clear understanding of each other, of everything, so nobody was confused. Besides that solid communication that they had, they were, they were also intending on making a solid city and building. A solid city and building. Because here we, we're not, we're, we, don't, we don't see something uh, that's temporary being erected. There's no buildings, there's no fences of wood, there's no buildings of wood. There are baked bricks. And there are other choices they could have used. They could, they could, have, they could have not baked the bricks. They could have just let them, let, them, let, them, let them be dried out in the sun and they would be fairly strong. And there are structures that we find today that are maybe 2,000, 3,000 years old in, in dry climates like Egypt or around the Dead Sea area that, that were not baked and they have lasted that long. But break, baked bricks, what we would consider a, a brick these days, is a solid thing. It's been break, baked in a kiln. It was clay, and, and it's now baked in, in a kiln. It's strong. And it in of itself is strong, but when you, when you, when you as it were, glue it together with mortar, with cement, and, and they used their mortar that they had was, 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 was a slime, so we could think of that maybe as a, as a slime from a tar pit or something like that, as a naturally occurring sticky substance. The oil sands up north have plenty of sticky substances, uh, and they use that to, to glue the bricks together. So what we're we understanding here is that the city and the tower that was in the city were meant to be permanent structures. They were settling themselves here in, in, in the land of Shinar, and there was to be a, a permanent building and a permanent tower, a permanent exaltation of man. They wanted to exalt themselves and it would be a permanent exaltation. They wanted to make a name for themselves and that name was to continue. And that of course is maybe the first in history, recorded history of the arrogant statements that man makes. Man makes terrible arrogant statements. Remember, the Nazis were talking about a thousand-year Reich. And if my math is good, it was 13 years. Just ever so slightly short fall. But the arrogance of it. What about the Titanic? The Titanic could never sink. It was the highest uh, quality, the biggest, the best. And yet it collided with an iceberg on its maiden voyage and sank to the bottom of the ocean. It was not the unsinkable ship. The Nazis were not the... The, the inconquerable people. Sinful man has always thought much more of himself than is the truth. And even this idea that man who, who's, whose short-term future is the grave still has this idea of being godlike or having a godlike status. The, the, the old, well, modern as well, but old religions are full of this idea that you could do something and you could earn your immortality. Of course, that is, goes back to the Garden of Eden. The, the ideas of, of man becoming God is part of the words of temptation that were spoken by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 and verse 5, the serpent says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And ye shall be as gods. You'll be, you'll be something glorious. You'll be more than you are. Not a mere collection of dust and ashes but you should be as gods. And that lies, that pride lies at the very heart of Babel, both the city and the tower. It's very normal to desire to have a city to live in, but to have a, have a tower to reach heaven with, to make a name. And that's still very much the case. You hear that people speak of that, you know, that they want to have, make a name for themselves in some way that, that their name would live on even though they're long dead. To make a name, to be something famous, to be something glorious. And that's very much in the human nature. Very much in human nature still. 
but there is something of a religious aspect here because not, not only the city, which is of course is for dwelling in, but also this tower itself says something of religion because they said they wanted to build a tower and is that tower again or just some some vague neutral secular thing remember secular is not neutral but let's just just play along for a second is there anything to do with it no because they say very clearly let us make us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven it is something of a man-made religion a man-made religion to glorify man not to glorify god we could say that this, this is a, a, an aspect of this ba Babylonian religion without divine command and without divine warrant. And so what we see then in that tower, as the tower, you know, as, as much as it was even built before God came down and stopped it, it, we see the swollen and godless pride of man. That's the idea. They want, they want man's pride to be exalted. As if to say to God, look at us we can reach heaven without thee we can reach heaven without god we can do it with the strength of our arm with the clay that we filled out of the earth we can take things from the earth and from the earth we can reach heaven that's at the very heart of man and the, the heart of false religion just let us do something here on earth with our abilities with, 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 with our sin and with our ideas with our imagination as the lord says and they have all one language in this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. But with that earthly, that godless imagination, what do they intend to do? We can reach heaven without any divine help. That's what they're saying. And that's their desire, to get to heaven. And of course, if they were to get to heaven, what would they do? The first thing they would do is to conquer heaven. They can't. Well, why else would they want to get to heaven? They want to exalt themselves and not God. They stop migrating. They, they desire to exalt their name. Thirdly, to unite their mutiny. They're uniting their mutinies, we see. He said they say in their own plans as they speak to each other. Go to verse 4. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. You see, they know the command of God. They know the command of God, and yet they don't want to be scattered. They want, they want to be just uh, farmsteads and, 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 and small holdings and, 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 and whatever. They don't want to be spread out and just have, the, have enough for their own family and, and to develop a little area. They want something more, as far as sinful man is concerned, more glorious, more famous, so they want to unite their mutiny, their rebellion, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth and they want to bundle themselves together. Now there are some people who have said, well therefore all cities are a form of evil. Now we don't get the rebuke from the Lord concerning building a city. We know that uh, there were cities that were built by the people of Israel, cities that were taken over by the people of Israel when they came from the wilderness into the land of Israel. And the Lord has never said that cities are bad in and of themselves. Some have certainly taken that as, a, as an idea. Now this is a, a wicked city with, with wicked motives. But they do not want to be scattered. And these are the last words that are uttered by the builders of the city and the tower that are recorded by the scriptures. They don't want to be weak and dependent upon God. They wanted to be something more. They wanted to bundle their strength, become powerful. You know that phrase, united we stand, divided we fall? Well, it's true then, it's true now, and it can be for good and for bad. It can be for good and for bad. The thing is, what are you united in? What unites you? What joins you together? That's the key thing, and Psalm 2 helps us here. Why do the heathen rage when the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, and we've read that already, but what do they say? Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That is, they do not want to be under the authority of God they don't want to be limited by the moral law of God. They want nothing to do with God. They want to be free to sin. They want to be free to dominate others. They want to be free to kill and to hurt and do whatever comes up in their heart. They want to do what they want to do. 
Now, they might not couch it in those terms. Very few people would actually say that. I want to be free to do anything I want to, which means kill you. Uh, no, nobody would actually admit to that, but that's really the, the next result. And that's why the very, the very basis of modern Satanism is the idea of, uh, do, is that, you know, do what you want, but do no one harm. But of course, that's not true. Doing what you want will always cause someone else harm, including yourself. But that Psalm, Psalm 2, then really gives us an indication of this, the mindset of this, I would use the word, anti-Christian union of people that we see at busy here in the land of, of Shinar. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. There's a union. There's a, a coming together of these kings against the Lord and against his anointed. What does that mean? Against the Messiah, against Christ. And I made that comment when we, when we looked at Psalm 2, that false religion, it has its arguments with other false religions. That's so we see that because man hates man a man would destroy man. That's in the sinful nature that we all bear. But there is something about the world against the true God and his Christ that, really, that they really hate. And we see here also that against Jehovah, against his Messiah, they've already attacked one branch of the people of God, the sons of Shem, of Asher. And we know in due course that these self-same, well, Nimrod himself wasn't what we would call a Babylonian, but from that area, uh, later on, many times, people would come and attack God's own people, as would Assyria, but that's beside the point. They're set against the word of Christ, they're set against the commandments of Christ, they're set against the people of Christ. And, and such was the goal of Nimrod and his empire in building this city and this tower. And there are unfortunate truths today that we see around the world, as I've already mentioned, to have a bundling together against God. And I, I will briefly say Marxism, and I've said it before, but it's very true. The, the, the goal of Marxism is to take over the whole world. That's what China's been doing. That's what Russia was doing in its heyday. And that's what all these little communist countries around the world uh, were doing. Uh, Marxism got, uh, finally managed to get into Namibia in, 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 um, in southeast, southwest Africa, and then came into um, South Africa. So much of the South African continent is now uh, ruled by Marxists. And, and they want to they take country by country, and they're, they're busy in the Horn of Africa, they're busy elsewhere as well. But Marxism calls itself internationalism. It calls itself internationalism. From the very earliest days, they, they were the internationalists. They, were, they weren't bothered about national socialism. And that's the big difference. That's the big ideological difference between the Nazis and the communists. The Nazis were happy to have a, a, a national socialism. It would be their country. And of course, their definition of country was maybe broader than the borders. But in any case, it would be the idea that there would be a country. This doesn't, I'm not promoting it. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying that's the difference. You have a national socialism because they're all socialists. The fascists are socialists. So Antifa is nonsense. They're only, it's, it's infighting because they're all godless Marxists of some, some sort. It's not true to call fascist Marxists, but they are socialists. So we have the fascists and we have the Marxist, international socialists and national socialists, totalitarian and godless, without a conscience. That's the thing that joins them all together. They're ruled by the devil in a most despicable way. But this is what Marxism wants to do. It wants to destroy any power structure that stands in its way. So it will destroy families. That's what BLM is after, to destroy families. That's what Marxism is after. That's what all these left-wing politicians are after, to destroy the family to destroy the understanding of your identity as a male or female, who you are as a mother and father, as a family, but also further afield to, to take down the church, any power structure that stands in the way of Marxism. Islam, it is also the whole goal of Islam to turn the whole world into what they call Dar al-Islam, which is the house of Islam. That's what they want to do. They want to, they want to take over uh, the world. And they were almost very successful in taking over uh, the whole of Europe in, in the 1500s and 1600s. But God held them back. 
And what they want is all peoples to be subject to Islam, which is essentially what Islam means, subjection. And if they do not convert to Islam, what is the way that they've been doing for the last 15, 16, 1,500 years? is to kill them or enslave them. So it's a similar idea that there is to be... So we already see in Marxism and Islam, we see two anti-Christian, anti, um, anti-God movements, and very much what we see here with Nimrod and with the Tower of Babel. Now, Islam does not agree with Marxism. It doesn't agree with Marxism's atheism or Marxism's immorality. And Marxism does not agree with Islam because it's a religion, and religion is the opium of the people. They believe that religion is bad, and religion is stops them getting into power because that's marxism is power mad and hungry and yet they will unite and support each other to destroy the lord and his christ exactly what psalm 2 says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the lord they don't love each other they hate each other but they love each other because your enemy was it the enemy friend of my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend so that's what we see and we see therefore a, a very a very satanic form of the great commission they want to take over the world they want to get to every people they want to have every people under their sway we want everybody to be under king jesus we want everybody to be saved by the gospel we want the, the, what we want, God wants. The Lord sends his church out into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. But we see that Marxism has its godless intention, its godless commission, and Islam as well. So we see, do see that, 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 how they protect and they support each other because in, in the same way we have this, we have this uh, godlessness, we have this tower of man's glory, even in Islam and and Marxism. But when we have rebellion against God, which we do see in those two systems I've mentioned, but also here, what else do we have? And we've mentioned it in, from Romans 1. If there's a rebellion against God and God is good, there's a rebellion against goodness. If there's a rebellion against God who is merciful, there's a rebellion against mercy. And if God is truth and He is, then there's a rebellion against truth. And if God is holy and He is, then there's a rebellion against holiness. And ultimately against the gospel itself. But there is a king that has come to conquer. And to conquer a people to himself. And how does this king conquer? Does this king come to conquer and to destroy and to pillage and to kill? No, he comes to give life. He comes to conquer those that have rebelled against him. And he conquers them and, and wins them to himself. King Jesus. King Jesus. So listen, if you think and listen to God's answer to Nimrod, the man of pride and the, and the whole of the building of this, of this pride-filled tower and city, God's answer we read in Psalm 2. Again, I come back to Psalm 2, verses 6 to 9. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So yes, there will be a destruction for those who do not bow the knee to King Jesus, but Jesus, the Lord Jesus has sent his church out and his preachers out to preach the good news. Yes, you are rebels. Yes, there is corruption within you. Yes, you are under God's wrath and judgment. And yet the Great Commission goes out and says, come and make peace with God. No longer be against God. No longer exalt yourself, but exalt God in your heart and humble yourself before him. Because God has set his king. God's king is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a merciful king, who is a good king, who is a king of truth. And he it is that speaks through the pulpit today to those that don't know him. You say, I've heard of him. You've heard of his name. You know about him. You may be being brought up. But is the Lord Jesus Christ living in your heart? 
It's his spirit indwelling you. It's his spirit conquering that natural rebellion that's within you and the desire to exalt yourself above him because that is the, the dividing matter and the deciding matter. If Christ is not living within you, then these things that we've seen that may be on a far smaller scale but in you, and yet they bring the judgment of God upon you. Rebellion and self-exaltation, pride. But the gospel says no. It says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Seek his glory and seek his ways. You must repent and believe the gospel. So we've seen something of the pride of Babel, and in the Lord's will this evening, we'll hear something of the judgment that is over Babel. Amen. Let us pray before we sing. Our Lord and our God, we must confess that this almost self-deification and self-glorification is deep within each and every one of us without any exception. And in some it is greater than in others. But if we're busy exalting ourselves in our own position, we're drawing thee down from, our, from thine. Lord, will thou help us to repent of our own towers of pride. Which would exalt ourselves and not Christ. And for those, O oh Lord, who do not know who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their own King, who has come and made a, a dwelling in their hearts, we pray this morning for the merciful power of God to be at work and to cause those young and old to call upon thee, to have mercy. Hear our prayer, Lord, for King Jesus' sake, amen. Our closing song is Psalm 2. Please open your, Bible, uh, your hymn books to Psalm 2. And we'll just sing the first five verses, please. Just the verses one to five. Why rage the heathen and vain things? Why do the people mind? Kings of the earth do that set themselves and princes are combined. Verses one to five of Psalm two. Let us stand to sing, please.
of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you.